And so we're really just going to jump right into this. Um, and so I have questions for each of you. We're also going to have time for audience questions. So at that time, if um, you guys could line up at the mics, and then we'll kind of go back and forth until time runs out. So if that's OK. Um, the first question is for Matt. So just kind of ground us in this story. Like, how did you become interested in the project? Um, and why did you decide to tell this story? Um, well, uh, StoryCorps, the oral history project um, that you may have heard of, they uh, have recording booths around the country, and people do long-form conversations that are archived at the Library of Congress, um, and that are also used to create uh, radio pieces on NPR. So they had approached me because they had a queer history initiative, um, and they asked if I could help them find interesting stories. And I had heard of the phenomena of intergenerational gay adoption um, in a pre-marriage era and was interested in finding stories related to it. Um, and so at the time, I was working with a producer uh, who is Walter's niece, Erica Nagel. And um, she had to call Steven Spielberg. So on the phone that evening, she said, I had to cold call Steven Spielberg. And I said, I had to cold call the owner of a clothing optional bed and breakfast who was adopted by his older lover in the 80s. And she said, oh, my uncle was adopted uh, by his lover, um, and his name was Walter. So I went home and I Googled you know, Walter Nagel, her last name, and she failed to mention that Walter's partner had been Bayard Rustin, the, who I was a huge fan of, although I feel that a lot of people don't know who he is, um, despite a very acclaimed documentary called Brother Outsider mm -hmm. that came out in 2000, I believe. And that's how I had heard of Bayard. So um, you know, that's how the whole project kind of got started. Yeah, thank you for that. And Walter, I feel like we all have so many questions for you. But <laughs> if I could just ground us in one. Um, so you were 27, and Bayard was 65. And so I mean, just intergenerational, interracial, like just tell us about, you know, like that experience and braving those intersections and like what were some of the challenges and what were some of the beautiful moments? Well, when I look back on it now and I, you know, hear, hear you ask that kind of a question, I mean, it seems like, gee, I mean, how did, how did we do this? But yeah. it was all very, very perfectly natural for us yeah. at the time. Uh, as I said in the film, I was kind of a, old 27, and Bard was a very youthful 65. Uh, and we really, you know, we really shared a uh, common, common values, common ideas, uh, common interests. And so, you know, aside from just kind of being attracted, you know, at the time I was attracted to older guys. That can't be the case too much anymore, because there are not that many that are older than me. <laughs> so I've moved in the other direction. Um, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we really just had a, a, a camaraderie, um, just a, a very comfortable. It was very, very, it was very easy very, very quickly. Uh, I think, you know, within two months. I mean, I was still on this kind of San Francisco idea. But about two months after we left, I mean, after we met, um, we just kind of agreed that uh, we were going to stay together for a while. So, yeah. uh, As far as the... You know, I mean, we were interracial, we were intergenerational, we were same sex. It was like, you know, what else could there possibly be that could, right. you know, be thrown up on our faces or held <laughs> against this? But we just, you know, kind of moved forward. And, and, you know, people that loved us and people that cared for us, our friends, our family, they were all cool with it. It was, it was very comfortable. Yeah, awesome. And then Sean, you know, as someone who um, studied academically, you know, race um, and ethnic studies, um, and also someone um, who was also younger and also African American, like, how did you first learn about Bayard Rustin? Um, and you know, what were your thoughts kind of before the film? And then, like, how has the film informed, you know, how you think about him and how you think about his legacy? Yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna try to get through each question here. <laughs> um, but I arrived at Bayard Rustin when I was in college. Um, I, you know, I consider myself a very good student of history prior to college, but I noticed in our history books, Bayard Rustin was purposely left out. Um, and, you know, given what we know about U.S. history and how it's taught to K through 12, 
Um, we know that black history in general generally has a very small uh, portion uh, located in those history books. So it would make sense why Byard would be left out as a marginalized person uh, being queer. Um, but having arrived at him in college, um, as I was coming into my own sexual identity as a black gay man, um, I took hold to Byard um, in a way that a lot of my peers did not. I really wanted to research him and study him and learn a little bit more about his life just so that I can see how things have changed since he um, kind of lived his life, kind of came into his own sexuality, lived within the movement as well, um, and see you know, kind of how that can um, kind of put some kind of focus on what I'm doing, where I locate myself within the black queer community today in the 21st century. Um, so watching the documentary was very eye-opening for me. Um, I had previously known that, you know, Byde Rustin had been in a long-term partnership with someone who was white, um, having had been a very, uh, you know, distinguished person within the civil rights movement. Um, so I, I took very um, serious interest in this because um, I considered it a very hot button issue for a lot of people. People would consider that to be um, kind of taboo, as you mentioned in, in the documentary. Um, so, you know, seeing the, the documentary really put into perspective how his, um, how his Quaker upbringing really helped him uh, come to terms with some of the decisions he's made, especially when it came to his personal life as well. Um, so just seeing how those things kind of overlapped, um, how his personal politics um, kind of channeled into his, um, his love life um, as well. Um, I think it was cool to see those, those layers there. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. And I love how there are like three distinct um, kind of different views and perspectives um, on Bayard, and that's what really, we're really looking to kind of show here. And um, this is a question for all of you. And so Matt, I was reading an article um, that you were quoted in, and you talked about Bayard's creative resistance. Um, so if you can talk a little bit more about that, um, and then the, so if you can talk about that, and then the question for all of us um, is, what type of creative resistance do you think is needed now? We're in very, very interesting times, you know, on, on multiple levels. Um, so just using this idea of creative resistance, like what do you think we can extract from that for today? Um, something I was thinking about while making the film is this continuum of things that uh, seem radical at one time and that become kind of more mainstream or accepted later. So uh, intergenerational adoption, I'm sure to most people seem like a radical step to obtain equal rights, um, but now gay marriage um, is part of the mainstream. So I think that's a kind of helpful framework to look at um, creative resistance now. Um, in terms of uh, conceptualizing things that uh, break rules or reimagine what rules could be um, uh, with the knowledge through history that that rule breaking um, sometimes becomes absorbed into the culture as something mainstream. Bayard's, Bayard's resistance was based on nonviolence mm -hmm. and on his Quaker upbringing. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea about nonviolence, it's really based on love. And so, you know, you go into the creative phase of resisting with the idea of eventually building community. Mm -hmm. I mean, the community is fractured and you're trying to heal it in some way. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of means that you're not going to be screaming in somebody's face or calling them a pig or calling them, you know, a racist comment or something like that. You're going to try and bridge the gap that already exists. Okay. And so that was kind of really the framework that Byard had to operate in. And so he had to come up with really, you know, creative, uh, creative demonstrations, creative marches, ideas that were really uniting people as opposed to just broadening, broadening the gap. And I think there exists such a gap now, it, there seems to, in, in the society that we have, that we need those kinds of creative thinkers and creative resistors more than ever. When I think about creative resistance, um, I always come back to what we're doing within our own communities to resist the forces that might tear us intra in the intra-community away from each other. Um, when I think about intersectionality, about being black and queer um, specifically, and 
given the challenges that we're up against socially and given the current political um, environment that we find ourselves in, I think it's more important than ever that we have serious conversations in our community about um, what we're doing to marginalize others who look like us, who come from the same backgrounds as us. I think it starts at home for a lot of us in terms of having those serious conversations before we talk about um, you know, extending the hand over to other communities. I'm not saying that they should happen separate from each other, um, or it shouldn't, they should, one should happen before the other, but saying that, you know, we should be resisting um, creatively and strategically different ideas that would pull us apart from one another, um, specifically within a black community or specifically within a, within a queer community. And a lot of people actually find a queer community to be very isolationist in and of itself, and very white and very male in and of itself. Um, we obviously know that's not true, right? So we have a lot to do internally as well um, in terms of rectifying uh, things that have been done um, in the past that have been wrong and that have marginalized people within our communities. So basically resisting um, those internal forces that can yeah. disrupt that. Thank you. No, I think as I reflect on um, Bayard in this film, I'm struck by the fact that it just took me so long to learn about him. Like, I think that I was in college um, when I found out about him. Um, and identifying as a black queer man myself, it was just so comforting to know that his presence was there, you know, his legacy is all throughout the civil rights movement and still lives on today. Um, but he is like still largely unknown in a lot of spaces. So kind of before we go to audience questions, Walter, I would love for you to kind of tell us like, what's the one thing that, that we, we wouldn't know about Bayard and that we wouldn't get from the documentary? Oh, that's interesting. Um, because I think this, this documentary kind of complements Brother Outsider mm -hmm. a great deal. Because in Brother Outsider, you see Bayard debating Malcolm X, you see Bayard at podiums talking and pointing his finger and, you know, very militant. And, yeah. you know, I think this, this, this one kind of shows a softer side of him. Yeah. Um, I think probably, you know, the fact that he was so human, he was so gentle, he was. Uh, very approachable. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was not somebody, I mean, even though he had achieved a certain, I guess you could say, rank or position in the civil rights movement, yeah. you know, that really didn't happen until after the March on Washington in 1963. And so he, you know, up to then he had kind of lived as a itinerant freelance troublemaker, if you will, you know, <laughs> kind of making the subsistence living and, you know. Um, so he wasn't really very full of himself, I guess. Yeah. You know, he didn't go around with bodyguards or limousines or anything like that kind of thing. Um, so I, I, I think just the fact that he was really so human and warm and really always willing to um, reach out to people, yeah. uh, especially young people. I mean, Bard was one of the leaders who was really known to, it was an inspiration and because of his radical politics, especially in his younger years, young people kind of gravitated to him because younger people tend to be more radical. So when Stokely Carmichael was coming up, uh, people like that, they, they really went to Bard as opposed to going to Roy Wilkins or Whitney Young. Yeah. Uh, they went to Bard and they went to Ella Baker, That's, that might be a name that is familiar to some of you, because they were really the, they were the voices within the leadership of the movement that were kind of edgy and, and progressive. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I think um, you know just his his spirit of youthfulness and his spirit of creativity uh, is something that you know is very important to his uh, legacy, to his life, and again something that uh, we need now. We need creative young people out there, yeah. Yeah. not relying on you know all the old methods that make change, mm -hmm. but to to forge ahead and use the tools that we have now. Absolutely, thank you. So do we have any audience questions? Um, I would love to know or have you speculate as to what uh, Bayard would be thinking and doing today in terms of the political landscape, in terms of where we are with um, gay rights, with things that are happening within the black community. Where, do you th where would he be positioned right now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think he would certainly be pleased with the progress that's been made over the last 50 years. Uh, he would have been disheartened by the 2016 election and, you know, maybe depressed for a day or two, but uh, would have gotten up 
two days later and gotten right back in the fight and started, you know, starting resisting. Um, yeah, I, th I, th I think that um, he, you know, Bayard and A. Philip Randolph, they dealt largely with the issues of racial discrimination and segregation and Jim Crow, you know, in the, in the 40s to the 60s. But then once some of those laws were passed and there was uh, civil rights legislation, the Voting Rights Act, they, re they really understood that the larger issue was poverty and economics. And that's something that is, is still with us and has, you know, the income inequality has broadened over these last years. And so the work that he was doing in the mid-60s, the work that Dr. King was doing at the time that he died, the Poor People's Campaign, I think those would really be issues that he would be focusing on. And, you know, I think a little le less so on identity politics, but more on bringing people together on the issue of economic justice. And something that I think about often um, is if Bayard was alive today, um, would he have been involved in any of the um, the political fights that black queer people are facing um, in this country at this time. Um, you know, as I've done research about Bayard, I've found very little of him, you know, engaging with black queer people of his generation. Um, and that's been something that has always been like a gray area for me. Like, I'm just like, hey, I'm sure he's probably done work and he's probably, he probably knows tons of people um, within the black queer community. But similarly to Baldwin, I, I often question, you know, how, what their ties were like and if they would kind of be the champions for black queer, um, you know, political issues that we're facing today. That's something I think about all the time. It's just something that I wish I had more context on. Mm. So thank you for asking that question. It's something I think about too. Hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Raheem. Um, so my question uh, is, so how do you think, um, like, kind of just, like, having, like, an interracial relationship is different back then than it is today? And kind of going off a little bit more of that, is that, would that be considered, like, you know, like, empowerment within, like, the black community? Or is that, like, kind of discouraged or frowned upon today outside of your race and going against the cause of, like, black empowerment? This is often something I think about as well. Um, like, given the documentary and seeing where Bayard Rustin comes from as far as his Quaker upbringing, I think that gives us a lot of context into how he went about, um, you know, engaging in relationships, um, which is very different. And also considering the fact that he was you know, up under Martin Luther King instead of, like, say, Malcolm X or, um, you know, someone who's more left. Um, I think that often can provide some insight into how you thought about um, interracial relationships. But I think at the time, I mean, I didn't live there, obviously. I didn't live back then, um, so I don't have as much context there. But um, I would imagine that there were a lot of questions that people had um, to his relationship. Um, and I think in a lot of ways we can draw parallels to today. I think interracial relationships are obviously less taboo than they were, um, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, that being said, there are a number of conversations that we have, honest conversations that we have, especially when it comes to black leadership, um, black people who are visibly um, out there who are representing communities um, about, you know, the relationships that they enter and how oftentimes they can portray um, something that might be different than what their work consists of. Um, that's something that I interrogate often. I don't really have an answer to it. Um, I just think that we, like more, the things more change, the, this, the way that more things change, like more things stay the same, I, I guess, in a situation. Um, but yeah, it's a very, it's a very uh, tricky issue, I guess. I'd like to add a few things. I, I think you really have to look at the whole context in which we were living. Um, first of all, there have always been people who have been against interracial relationships. 
there always were, and there still are, and there probably always will be. Um, as, there wasn't a gay movement. I mean, during, during the time that I met Bayard, there was. But in the time that he was maturing, there was not really much of a gay movement to speak of. There were a few organizations, but uh, you know they weren't very high profile, high visibility. Uh, and certainly, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how many out black gay men you could name from his generation. Maybe you could name more than I could. I mean, people always refer to James Baldwin. Uh, Wooden Bard, you know, had a relationship with James Baldwin, a friendly relationship, and like they occasionally appeared on panels together and worked together and that kind of thing. Um, but Bard was different because he was out there. He was more authentic. He didn't lie about who he was. There was a generation of gay men, regardless of color, who remained in the closet, who married, marriages of convenience, if you will, so that they could advance their careers, had families. You know, Bard didn't do that kind of thing. So the number of people who were really living their authentic selves, and, and Baldwin was one also, uh, were very few. So in terms of, you know, the pool of applicants, I guess you could say, for having relationships, for Bard having relationships with people was not that, that great. If you think about, you know, the size, of the, the percentage of gay men in the world, the percentage of black gay men in the world, the percentage of black gay men in the world who had an education, who were interested in nonviolence, who were political, I mean, you know, it keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, Barr did have relationships with black gay men, sexual relationships, but in terms of long-term partners, that's really about values and um, they're just, you know, the pool of applicants, if you will, was just not that great. We've had a few conversations internally about um, mostly white folk uh, sort of um, working on narratives around folks of color and the inherent uh, sort of problematic areas that we can get into by representing other people's stories um, that involve experiences that we will never be able to experience as, um, as white folks. So I'm curious, a uh, question for Matt is, um, did you encounter any challenges since you were telling Walter's story, certainly, but this was also a story about Bayard. I'm curious whether you encountered any challenges um, trying to sort of create an artistic narrative of a man of color, um, knowing that that was not your experience, recognizing also that directors do um, create stories about people that are not exactly like them, but this might be a particular, I could imagine this being a particular challenge. So I'd be interested in hearing how you approach that. Yeah, it's a, I think about that a lot, and I do make films, um, mostly not from my point of view, but from the point of view of uh, characters, for lack of a better word. Um, and while thinking of this, I do ask myself the question, this is a great story, um, am I the person to tell it or is my job to get out of the way and let other people tell a certain story? And um, in a sense, even though I made this film, um, because I chose to do it entirely from Walter's point of view, um, he's, he's telling um, this story uh, which is a story of the civil rights movement, but through a very particular personal lens. Um, and Walter's been such an um, amazing ambassador for Bayard's legacy, and that's part of the reason I didn't feel like um, the film needed additional points of view to historicize Bayard. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think there's been recent films, like a film about Martha P. Johnson, where um, these issues have really come to the fore um, about... Um, you know, uh, authorship and um, kind of, uh, I guess, as white people getting out of the way sometimes instead of talking and listening more. So, um, you know, it's sometimes a limitation to my, ex my ability as a filmmaker when I think about that. Bayard Rustin was like totally inspirational for me in college as well. Um, the movie Brother Outsider and his early life as a communist and his like converse, like his debate with Martin uh, with Malcolm X like I thought those were his like really interested in his early politics. I guess when you met him, did you know who he was before he introduced himself? Before he introduced himself to you, like we're like, oh, that's he's like this big shot. Like, how was that? What was that like? Just as a personal experience, like. <laughs> well, there was a when I at the moment that I met him, I wasn't sure. I knew who I had known who Bayard Rustin was. Mm -hmm. 
But Bard was noted for carrying a walking stick, mm -hmm. cane. Well, a, it's only a cane if you need it. He didn't need it. It was a, wa it was a walking like stick, um, a style, you know, a, a style uh, accessory. So um, he didn't have it with him that afternoon. So I wasn't sure, but you know, he introduced himself. But I had known because I was interested in the movement in my in my high school years, and Bard was showing up in the press quite a lot. I, you know, I knew who he was. I didn't know who he was. Well, thank you so much, uh, Matt, Walter, and Sean. Um, it's really been a treat for us to bring uh, this screening to Google and the partnership with the It Gets Better Project. Uh, thank you for that. And, and also, I just want to thank you guys for humanizing Bayer for us um, and, and bringing home uh, this notion of love and respect and creativity. Um, and I think that that transcends um, time and space. So thank you all so much. Um, and thank you all for coming.